Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's time for another episode of Not Your Mother's Goose, with more of the stories of your youth mixed with the cynicism of your crazy Uncle Larry. I'm Topher Goggin. Coming up today, we'll get a good night's sleep with the princess and the pea, try not to throw out our backs yanking out the sword and the stone, and fire up Facebook to see what's on Humpty Dumpty's news feed. To get things started, though, I do joke after joke about Rapunzel. Those turn out to be really easy to write, but we actually have not delved into her real story yet. It's the number one fairy tale involving a fight over stolen vegetables, and it's time to give it a look. The Story of Rapunzel Listen, I'm not saying that some people overreact or anything, but try this on for size. A husband gets caught by the kooky neighbor gal while he's committing the treasonous crime of stealing her radishes. The lady's response? Threaten to kill the guy and his pregnant wife unless they fork over their new kid when she's born. For radishes? If I ever got tricked into growing radishes and someone else was so kind as to come and steal them, I'd give that person a reward. Regardless, the woman gets the man to agree to this, picks up baby Rapunzel from the birthing ward, and does what any normal person would do in this situation. Locks her new child in the big, tall, stairless tower in the backyard. Rapunzel spends her days up in the tower doing, well, whatever you do when you're locked in a tower 24-7. Probably the jumble. Each day is highlighted when the crazy gal shows up outside the window and demands admission by speaking the most famous entry request phrase in fairy tale history, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. Rapunzel, of course, responds by letting down her exceptionally long hair, which one hopes doesn't refer to the hair on her chinny-chin-chin, and the wacky lady then climbs up for a visit. One day, a prince comes riding by on horseback. You'll notice there's a lot of princes out roving the countryside in these stories. He hears Rapunzel at the window having a little one-person tower sing-along, probably rapping some Eminem or something like that. He's immediately enchanted by her voice, but lacking access to high-quality pole vaulting equipment, has no way to get up to Rapunzel's window. Instead, he's forced to hide in the bushes with his binoculars until he can figure out how the nutty homeowner woman makes her daily entrance. Once Prince Peeping Tom finally learns the magic words to gain admission, he tricks Rapunzel into dropping her tresses for him instead. They immediately hit it off. Actually, in one version of the story, she ends up pregnant, so maybe her hair wasn't the only thing being lowered. And they begin plotting how to bust Rapunzel out so they can start living happily ever after. Unfortunately, neither of these two is exactly a physics wizard, so this turns out to be a bit of a struggle. They devise some sort of plan where the prince will smuggle silk up to Rapunzel until she has enough to make a ladder and climb down to freedom. Okay, Einsteins. Of course, this plan doesn't come even close to working. The crazy lady catches on to the scheme and responds by chopping off Rapunzel's hair and booting her out to live in the woods. The lady uses the leftover locks to lure the prince up to the now Rapunzel-less tower, gives him the bad news that his girlfriend is gone, and throws him back out the window and into a big pile of thorns where he ends up blind. Kind of a crappy day for him. But not all is lost. The prince randomly wanders around in the woods, bumping into trees for a while, until one day he hears a familiar voice busting rhymes and belting out Kanye West lyrics. The lovers are soon reunited. And then, in a convenient bonus, Rapunzel starts crying, and darn if her tears don't just happen to cure blindness. Suddenly the prince can see again, and he and Rapunzel ride off into the sunset, either to rule his kingdom, or maybe to open up a roadside stand selling radishes. We'll check out the news next, maybe that roadside stand will be this week's sponsor. Anyone can subscribe to one of those real newspapers that show up in your driveway every morning. But the Wall Street Journal isn't going to tell you the latest about Jack's new beanstalk endorsement from miracle Grow. Let's check the headlines. Hare named winner after tortoise fails post-race drug test. Rudolph's nose no longer red. Credits switched to two-ply tissue. And rockabye baby, Senate passes treetop cradle ban. The long-standing tradition of hoisting babies and rocking cradles atop tall trees may be on the brink of ending 
doomed by a new set of restrictions passed by the state Senate yesterday. The so-called rock a bye bye bill was proposed after a $16 million state-funded study first discovered the shocking dangers of treetop cradles. The report's authors noted that while it is true that when the wind blows, the cradle will rock, we believe the convenience provided by such an arrangement is outweighed by the recently uncovered hazards posed by balancing a bassinet atop a 40-foot blue spruce. For instance, a baby could have its eyes pecked out by a nesting bird, or the tree might be cut down by a rogue lumberjack marauding through the area. Despite strong opposition from the National Crib Makers Lobby, the governor is expected to sign the bill next week. In the meantime, crews were spotted with an extension ladder yanking down the cradle currently dangling from four twigs atop the red oak in the backyard of the state house. Time now for a quick break. Back after this word. We all know the online dating world is no fairy tale. Sure, you can do the Cupid Shuffle. Swipe to the left, swipe to the right, but that won't get you any closer to finding your dream date. But now there's a brand new service that's sure to guide you straight to your happily ever after. You've heard of plenty of fish. I'm here to introduce you to Heaps of Frogs, the new fairy tale dating service dedicated to helping you find your prince or princess. At Heaps of Frogs, we'll match you to other fairy tale daters in just 45 seconds. That's because it's all based on our proprietary algorithms, designed by the same geniuses that brought you the Which Muppet Are You? BuzzFeed quiz. It's a can't-miss dating delight. Just listen to some of our customers. What the hell is this? I asked for matches ages 29 to 38, and it keeps giving me old King Cole and wee Willy Winky in his nightgown. Who do you think I am, old Mother Hubbard? Oh, you think that's bad? You're lucky. One of my matches just keeps sending me pics of his beanstalk. No, no, it's not under my real name. Of course not. It's under Clay. He's a surfing instructor. Says he's friends with Gaston. Oh, oh, hey, Anna, we're back. Yes, uh, you can see. Two more happy Heaps of Frogs customers. So, uh, what are you waiting for? When you sign up for our Georgie Porgy bundle, your first five matches are free. You know it'll be great, so set up your Heaps of Frogs profile today. Welcome back, and thanks to Clay and the other satisfied customers for their help with Heaps of Frogs. Let's see what else is happening. Analysts say no clear favorite in Dopious Dwarf Contest. Mary obtains restraining order against Lamb that keeps following her. And we'll now wrap up today's news with the obituary notices. Pinocchio Bertarelli. Beloved wooden puppet Pinocchio passed away Saturday at his home, succumbing after a lengthy battle with Dutch elm disease and termites. He was 47. The carving of Italian woodcutter Geppetto Bertarelli, Pinocchio's early life was marked by one wild adventure after another, not to mention more than a handful of nose-expanding lies. Among other incidents, Pinocchio spent time in a marionette act, narrowly avoided being turned into a donkey, and eventually rescued Geppetto after the elder Bertarelli was swallowed by a whale. Pinocchio continued to fame later in life, but never escaped the effects of his lie detector nose, which grew frequently when he appeared on a season of the CBS television show Survivor. A 2012 run for the U.S. Senate was similarly short-circuited when, during a televised debate, Pinocchio promised to lower taxes only to have the nose shoot forward so quickly it knocked over a TV camera. Memorial services are scheduled for Thursday. In keeping with his wishes, Pinocchio's body will be run through a wood chipper and spread as mulch in the family flower beds. In lieu of flowers, the family has requested donations to Pinocchio's No Strings on Me Foundation, a nonprofit helping troubled youth live independent lives, preferably without getting themselves locked in a birdcage like its founder. Rumpelstiltskin. We're going to make this into our tower-locking episode and try to get all of these things out of the way at once. This is at least a little more productive use of a tower, churning out some gold and all, so hopefully the miller's daughter qualified for some sort of tax exemption. Remember to keep your receipts. A local miller gets into a chat with the king, because those two people obviously are bumping into each other at Home Depot every day, and idly slips into the conversation that 
Oh, you know, my daughter just happens to be able to spin straw into gold. Well, that's a useful talent. You might want to get in touch with Simon Cowell on that one. Regardless, the Brainiac King is intrigued. He sends for the girl, locks her in a tower, and tells her that she has three days to spin up some bling or he's going to kill her. So that worked out pretty well from her standpoint. Then, in a stunning plot twist, we learn that the daughter actually cannot make gold out of straw. She is, however, quite good at crying, and balls for a good two days, right until a tiny little man suddenly appears in the tower with her. Quite conveniently, this particular little man has a special talent, spinning straw into gold. He agrees to spin for her, multiple times, but it's not like he works for free. Instead, each time he trades off his efforts for an ever-escalating list of personal items. Necklaces, rings, Justin Bieber tickets, you get the idea. As the little guy churns out loot, the girl sends it along to the king and passes it off as her own. But instead of praising her fine work, his highness just keeps expanding his demands. One day the girl runs out of things to barter with Sir Spinalot, leading the gnome dude to say that he'll spin one more time in exchange for her firstborn child. Knowing that she actually had a kid five years earlier who turned out to be a complete holy terror, she immediately agrees. The little fella spins up a final load and the miller's daughter delivers the finished product. The king responds, as you would expect, by immediately marrying her. Nine months later, she delivers their first child. No sooner has the rabbi finished up the kid's circumcision, though, than the mysterious little man reappears to pick up his payment. The new Mrs. King is distraught, but then, in a deft negotiating maneuver that they only teach in the most expensive seminars, Tiny says that he'll let her out of the whole deal if she can guess his name in three days. Okay. The man comes back each of the next two days, allowing the girl to guess as many times as she wants. She fires off every name she can think up, consults www.weirdbabynames.com, and even calls up Gwyneth Paltrow to see if she's had any bright ideas lately. Nothing works. With one day left, the baby is on the verge of immediately becoming the tallest member of his new household. At this point in the story, many folks believe that the queen's neck gets saved when her messenger stumbles onto the little man chanting his name around a campfire. Come on, people, let's be realistic here. In the real world, little elf men that can spin straw into gold don't go around name-checking themselves at campfires like they're cutting a record. Truth is, the small fry just goes out to the bar that night, and the royal bouncer is so convinced that his Rumpelstiltskin ID is a fake that he calls the palace in hopes this might be an offense worthy of the dungeon. That's the real story. News of the possible name quickly gets back to the queen. She's skeptical, but it's not like she has any better ideas. When the little man shows up the next day and confirms that he does not go by McLovin, Dweezil, or Carlos Danger, the queen suggests, well, then maybe your name is Rumpelstiltskin. Somehow, the royal name police confirm that Queenie is correct, and her baby is forever saved from a life with a father that has an endless supply of gold. Because that sure would have sucked. Shorty, on the other hand, is not pleased by this unexpected development. Depending on the version of the story, he either A. stomps his foot into the ground so hard it gets stuck, B. physically tears himself in half, or C. runs off never to be seen again, but later is rumored to have joined a carnival running the I'll guess your name or you win a free stuffed animal. This is Rip Van Winkle. The only reason I set my alarm clock is to listen to Not Your Mother's Goose. The Princess and the Pea. First of all, just full disclosure here, I am not a big fan of peas. If they don't have at least a half a gallon of ranch veggie dip on them, it ain't happening for me. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm fully in favor of stuffing peas under mattresses. That sounds like a good place for them to me. And it actually runs in our family. As a kid, my dad got busted hiding his peas underneath the couch so he wouldn't have to eat them. So this fairy tale ranks very highly on our list. Let's check it out. A prince is on the prowl for a bride, but seems to be having a problem finding himself a real princess. Must have been a barrage of fraudulent royalty going around these parts at the time which I've discovered can also be a barrage of flatulent royalty if you're a poor typist. One particular night, a monstrous rainstorm hits. Soon there's a knock at the castle door, and the king and queen answer it to find a bedraggled woman soaking wet on their doorstep. She's desperate to get in out of the storm, and asks if she can stay the night. 
Since she left her AAA card at home and the castle doesn't seem to offer an AARP discount, she tries the old, oh, by the way, I'm a princess routine in hopes of securing nicer accommodations. This claim gets the queen's attention, as apparently she was thinking the drowned rat on her porch would make a nice catch for the prince, but only if she's a real princess. Utilizing the secret international protocol for princess testing, the queen invites the girl to stay, then proceeds to stack up 20 or so mattresses on top of a single pea in the girl's bedroom. She also sets the sleep number on the top mattress to 97. The girl heads to bed, somehow not finding it odd that she has to scale an extension ladder balanced on top of a trampoline just to hit the sack. She actually sleeps like a log, but, hoping to add a complimentary breakfast to her free stay, claims that she tossed and turned all night and ended up just watching reruns of Mr. Belvedere on the room TV. The queen logically assumes that the lady couldn't sleep because she's so incredibly sensitive that she felt the pee, and further concludes that the only person who could be so delicate is a real princess. Seems safe to bet that Sleeping Beauty won't be marrying into this family anytime soon. Based upon this brilliant deduction, the queen is completely convinced that the drenched and disoriented traveler that appeared on her doorstep is the perfect person to marry her son. The girl, of course, thinks this plan is just fine. This is no time for her to be hopping off the gravy train. And the prince is shockingly on board as well. So they get hitched, just like that. I just hope they get separate beds at the palace. All right, something a little different to wrap things up this week. You know, if you really want to know what's going on in the lives of these characters, social media is obviously the place to go. I pulled some strings and got Humpty Dumpty to give us a look at his Facebook news feed. So let's do a little scrolling and see what we can learn. So if we start out here, we've got a post from Lord Godiva. He says, anybody seen my wife? Haven't seen her tonight and the horse is gone. And there's a couple of replies to this. Henry Johnson says, uh, dude. You have no idea, LOL. And Dwayne McClinic says, your wife is hot. Okay. Frosty the Snowman has posted here. He says, not to start any arguments, but I'm starting to get a little worried about global warming. Oh, Farmville. Farmville making an appearance. Jack Spencer with the post. and says Jack could really use some help fertilizing his beanstalk in Farmville. And you got to click here or a spot you can click here to get some magic beans if you'd like. Cinderella is, oh, okay, Cinderella is looking for recommendations. Let's see what she says. She says, this is rather ironic, but anyone have suggestions if you cut your foot on broken glass? No replies on that one yet. Got a post here from Judy, the farmer's wife, Thompson. She says, enough of these stupid blind mice. And she's checking in from Carl's Carving Knives, so I can see where that's headed. We've got your classic Facebook food photo here. Looks like the third little piggy has posted this one, and it appears to be a roast beef sandwich. And then a comment from piggy number four who says, I didn't get any. Oh, new friends being made here. Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater and John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt are now friends. And let's see. Next up, it's a post from Pinocchio. Looks like he's at school. He says, I'm in woodshop class, and the teacher just said we're out of lumber. Everyone is looking at me. This is definitely not good. Georgie Porgy also weighing in just says, Georgie Porgy has mono. Peter Piper replies, Gee, wonder how that happened. We've got a check-in from the hare. He says, Race time punks kicking ass and taking naps with the tortoise. And Rip Van Winkle likes this one. Post from someone, I'm not sure who this is, Steve Shepard. And Steve Shepard just posts, Wolf! Then there's a comment from Brad Morrison who says, Shut up, Steve. Julia Gross replies, We're not falling for this again. Julia then another comment, What is this, like four times now? Steve then says, No, I mean it this time. I need your help. Brad then with the asterisk Y-O-U-R moron, because Steve went with I need Y-O-U apostrophe R-E help, of course. And Brad then continues, And shut up, we're sick of this. Steve then replies again in all caps, I'm serious, wolf, wool, And that is the end of the thread, it appears. What else we got? Just a couple more here. It looks like Jack Spratt is selling Herbalife products and would like us all to sign up. He's having a special on some fat-free shakes. Well, he would be the right guy for that. Uh, Goldilocks is attending break-in at the Bears' house, if anyone would like to join. And here's one. 
The Muffin Man has started a new job at Muffler Man. Well, that ought to work out well. And then finally, Old McDonald with a post. He says, you'll never guess what I found in my wife's closet. And Bob Davidson replies, a moo-moo here and a moo-moo there? All right, I should probably stop here before I scroll my way straight to a 20-minute long segment. That'll bring us to the end of this episode of Not Your Mother's Goose. But catch us next time when we'll take a fresh look at the Jungle Book, examine the building materials market with the three little pigs, and we'll pay another visit to Rapunzel's Jukebox to listen to what's sure to become one of your ten favorite songs written about the Little Red Hen this year. Until then, thanks so much for listening. My name is Topher Gog, and remember, the goose is loose. I'll see you next time for more here on Not Your Mother's Goose. To a pod mini original production. You're not you're, 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 Thank you. <laughs> pod mini. Thank you.